My wife and I just moved into this new house and I get the two car garage as my home office slash studio. I live in Florida and it's May now, so naturally it's about 6,000 degrees outside at all times. The solution, a mini split AC heat pump. In this video, I'm gonna show you how I installed that thing, which is making this 450 square foot concrete room a perfect 72 degrees. I went with a cheap brand that I've never heard of before. Not that I'm tuned into the HVAC scene by any means, but you can buy these mini splits from companies you know, like LG or Mitsubishi your Bosch. And for sure, those will probably maybe be more reliable. But since I was going to install this myself, and since it's my first time doing it, I figured there's probably a 50-50 shot that I would just discharge all of the coolant from the machine on accident. So I went with the cheaper brand from Amazon. So far, it's great. It's quiet. It's cold. It works awesome. It's been working for two days. But I've been really surprised at how quiet it is inside and outside, how well the app works with my phone, whether I'm home or not. You can talk to the thing because it's hooked up to the house's Wi-Fi. And how easy it was to put the thing together. I am an AC installer now. Here's how that all went down. First, I picked a spot on the wall. A heat pump will be most efficient higher up on the wall when cooling. That's where all the warm air hangs out and we want to pump that heat out. I'm only going to use this thing for cooling because in Florida it pretty much never gets cold enough to turn the heat on. So I chose a spot on my garage wall that had power nearby and it was a reasonable placement for the outside unit on the other side of that wall, which will ultimately be hidden by my garbage cans, which will ultimately be hidden by a bush later on. As far as installing the inside unit, it came with a bracket that's basically a French cleat, which just means that once this metal thing is on the wall, you can literally just reach up and plop the blower on there. There's no tools involved after installing the bracket. The bracket needs tools. So I leveled this thing out, taped up a little line, used a Tapcon bit on a hammer drill, that's important, to punch a few holes. These Tapcon concrete anchors can hold literally hundreds of pounds per screw. They're blue, they're easy to find on the shelf, and they come with the right size bit in the box. So I only used three screws to hold this thing up, even though it's riddled with mounting holes. Good to have options, I guess. I didn't read the manual for this part. Next, still on the indoor unit, I flipped it over on its back to expose the high pressure and low pressure lines. This is where you'll screw on the big padded hoses that go outside to the outside unit. So these hoses are basically what needs to somehow pass through the wall. If your place is wood framing, then it's a whole lot easier than if it's concrete block. But I came up with a workaround so I wouldn't have to punch through the cinder blocks in my wall. Anyway, when you take the cap off this high pressure hose, it's gonna shoot out a bunch of gas. That was a lot. Don't freak out. Well, you'll probably freak out. It's very startling, but this is by design. I don't know what the design is, but it's supposed to be like this. On the video that I watched to gain confidence on this project, the learn to DIY guy had to pierce the end of his for some reason. Mine just screwed off. Next up, there are these knockouts in the plastic housing where you'll pass your hose through. Pick a side and cut those out somehow. I think I used a knife. Then it was time to start chopping holes in my new house. Medium terrifying, but make sure your hole saw is big enough so you don't have to go through that twice. It would be the easiest thing or the fastest thing to just drill a hole straight through the wall right next to the unit, since the outside part of this will just be on the other side of the same wall. But that's only easy if your wall is not a cinder block wall. I didn't want to fight that fight, so upon further inspection, the blocks stop at about 10 feet up in my house. And I can get up into my attic and just reach over that wall to where the eave is on my roof line. There's already a couple of electrical conduits jammed jammed through the eave from the backside of my breaker panel. So I knew it was completely fine to go this route. Is it root or route? Is it both? I got up into the attic, reamed a hole down through the garage ceiling above the AC, and then went outside and cut a hole up through the eave in about the same spot. Next, the heat exchanger that sits outside has little feet on it. They're 16 and a quarter inches apart if you get the same one. If you put this on the ground, then it has to be on a concrete pad. So I wanted to attach it to my wall. And they do sell these like pre-made little brackets from Amazon that attach it to your wall. I'll link a kit to one of those below, but I really wanted to make my own for some reason. So instead, I bought some hardware for some Unistrut channels that I have laying around at the warehouse, you know, like you do, and then, then chop that stuff into these nice little industrial L brackets, which I then bolted to the wall outside my house. Just maximizing the number of times that I can cut into and drill into the vapor barrier of my house. Do they put a vapor barrier on cinder block? I don't think they do. I don't remember. Whatever. With those in place, I heaved this thing onto my new brackets, and they mostly fit perfectly, more so after I bolted the thing to the thing, and then went back inside to work on the electrical part of the inside unit. Once you flip the inside unit back over, you'll see a wiring panel on the right side. Pop that thing off, and you're met with a whole bunch of screws with some numbers and then a grounding symbol. You don't actually have to know what you're doing for this part. Conveniently, they numbered the screws and then numbered the wires that go onto those corresponding screws. So just make sure those line up and you're good to go. You're gonna 
to find the same thing on the outdoor unit. Not quite sure why they didn't number the ground, but instead used the electrical diagram symbol for ground, but that's what that is. The only particular thing that you want to be careful about for this part is that the wire slips under this little clip thing under the screw. That holds it in there really good. With those wires connected, you're almost ready to start connecting the inside part to the outside part. But before you can do that, you need to straighten out these insulated copper lines. They're sort of delicate, just because if you bend copper too many times, it will eventually crack at some point. And as any Gen X middle-aged man will remember from high school, crack kills. So try to do this just once. With those lines straight-ish, flip your indoor heat exchanger on its back again and hook up those lines. They're only gonna fit in the correct way, so you can't screw this up. There's a big one and a small one. The big one won't fit on the small one. And if you happen to buy this same unit, there's a link below. The nuts on the thinner line are 9 16 and 11 16 The bigger one is 11 16 and adjustable wrench because I don't have a big enough spanner. Get those things good and tight. There's a page in the manual for the actual torque figures, which you should use, but I don't have a torque wrench that'll work for this. So pretty darn tight, but not so tight that you're gonna rip the brass threads off is what I'm going with. Good luck. Then there's no doubt some correct type of tape to use here to maximize the thermal envelope, but I work in production, so I'm using black gaff because black gaff is the way. Either way, it's better to close these things up somehow than not at all. So find a way to do that. You're not gonna see it once it's done. Mounting the actual indoor blower unit on the wall is simple. It's very light. And like I said, the way the bracket works, there's just these little hooks that catch these little grabby arms. So you can just put it up there and it's gonna rest on those. Now the power slash data lines are connected. The hoses are connected. It's time to fish them up through the attic and down to the outdoors. The copper lines are gonna be a little floppy and awkward because they're made out of a metal tube that you're bending as you move around. So it's a bit of a unique experience if you've never done any work with thin walled copper tubes, which most of us haven't probably. But I just messed with them a bit and got them jammed up into that hole. And then the real fun happened in the attic. Fun fact about living in Florida, in May, it's in the 90s outside, which makes the attic, oh, I don't know, 140 degrees. It was a bit of a struggle up there, but with the help of Tommy the Pipe Bender, my Insta360 camera can see around corners. So that's like set up as a monitor. Let me go back in the garage. Yeah, we might be towards the bottom. It's hard to tell. We were able to fight through the 15 or so feet of copper hoses going up through one hole and down the other to connect these two machines together. Heat pumps are seemingly magical devices. It's not actually creating cool air in the garage. It's taking advantage of a neat little physics hack, phase changing this refrigerant substance from a gas to a liquid and back to a gas again to sort of act like a sponge which will soak up the heat inside the garage, move it outside and wring out that heat outside. I'm gonna make a whole how heat pumps work video when I get back from Texas next week because I also bought a heat pump washer dryer combo unit that uses the exact same principles as a mini split AC to dry your clothes. But it uses like one fifth of the amount of electricity as an electrical dryer. Anyway, after I got all the hoses out the hole and down to the outside heat exchanger, I took all the caps off the ports here, screwed those lines onto the up-facing flare fittings on the side there, and again, the correct line will only fit on the correct fitting, so you don't have to worry about screwing this part up either. You do have to torque them down enough, but not too much though. And I use the same principle outside that I did inside of pretty dang tight, but not like all my might. Maybe. Think of like the full one rep max strength of a woman who's like an office worker or read the manual and follow the manual or have someone help you. And this brings us to the most technical portion of the install. You need to draw all the air out of those lines and the inside heat exchanger. You do this by connecting a set of manifold gauges to the other port on the low pressure side of the inlet on the outside unit. Then you connect a pump to this set of gauges, which is gonna suck out all the air from the system. Start by closing off all of the valves on the gauges. You won't use the red side for anything. In fact, if you get this gauge, you can just take these hoses off. They're not part of it. The red and the yellow won't be used at all. So you'll connect a blue hose and a vacuum hose to your gauges. Some gauges only have blue, yellow, and red, in which case you'll use the yellow line on the vacuum. But some have this dedicated black vacuum line. I bought the one with the dedicated line. I'll put a link in the description to this manifold gauge set because I know it works with this AC. Then you also need a vacuum pump, something like a 5 CFM vacuum pump. I'll put a link to one of those also. These things are each under a hundred bucks. And this set of gauges came with additional fittings, one of which did fit 
on this mini split. Some automotive ones don't and you have to buy an adapter. So start with all the gauges closed off. And on the pump, make sure you cap off the port that you're not using. There's two inlets on that pump. Both will suck in air. It's for different size fittings. You're only gonna use one of those, make sure there's a cap on the other one so the air doesn't get in there. I forgot to do this and couldn't figure out why I had no negative pressure on my gauges at first when I hooked the whole thing up. So connect the blue hose from your manifold to the service port on your mini split. That's this port on the bottom, the only one that's left. And when the connections on these things have these little knurled fittings, that means they just need to be however tight you can get them with your hands. You don't need to use tools. Connect the black hose to your vacuum pump. With those two hoses connected and all the valves still turned off, turn on your pump. Then open up the blue knob and then the vacuum knob on your manifold. At this point, you should see the needle on this blue gauge go from zero to like negative 30. Everyone on the internet wants you to leave this hooked up and running for at least 15 minutes. I don't know exactly why, but I followed the collective and I did that. Next, with the vacuum still running, close off the blue valve. After closing the blue valve, you can close off the vacuum valve and then turn off your pump. Still leaving everything hooked up this way, watch your gauge for five minutes. You don't want it to move. If it moves just a tiny bit when you first shut everything off, but then doesn't move anymore, you're golden. This is how we're checking that all those lines and all those fittings are perfectly sealed. If you're not, you'll have a leak and your AC will only be cold for a little while and all of your refrigerant will find its freedom in Earth's atmosphere, which is firmly the wrong place for it. Someone worked really hard to extract those chemicals out of other chemicals and then jam them into this machine and that's where they're most useful to us. So if the needle on your blue gauge doesn't move for five minutes, you're good. You did it. This thing's ready to go. You can simply unscrew the fitting at the other end of the blue line that's plugged into the heat pump and just put these gauges and that pump away until your car's AC stops being cold because you'll do this exact same process to add coolant to that system. Let me know if you'd like to see how. <laughs> Now that you're confident you don't have any leaks, you can take a five millimeter Allen wrench and open up both of the valves that are built into the side of the unit. That's gonna allow the refrigerant to leave this heat exchanger and fill those tubes that are currently in a vacuum. Now we're on to the outside electrical. And those same lines from the black line on the inside have those same corresponding numbers on them on the outside, so you can't screw this up either. However, the part where you're powering the unit itself from outside, I'm gonna redact the video. Even though it's 100% up to code, it will definitely pass all the inspections. I went to school for engineering, I am not an electrician, and you should hire one of those to do this part. Unless you know how, in which case you don't need to see it still. And if you don't know how, you can die. It's like really, really unlikely that you would die with modern electrical systems that have all these safety measures to shut off the power when you do the wrong thing. But anyway, blah, 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 hook up the power to the outside and you are ready to run. And the very last part of this process is this vinyl tape that comes with the kit so that you can bundle up and wrap up all the lines and all the data and all the electrical into one sort of neat looking like aspen tree branch that comes out of the eave of your house. I'm gonna be getting this into some sort of metal cover. It's gonna look a lot less noticeable going down the wall there, but that's a project for another day. I need to get on a plane tomorrow morning to go see Green Screen Andy in real life in Texas. Oh, and here it is over my shoulder. Perfectly cooling this 20 by 25 foot concrete garage with 10 foot ceilings and no extra insulation, even in the hot, hot heat of the early summer. It's got a ton of different settings, it's got an app, and on the low blower mode, you almost can't even hear it. It seems like the compressor has some sort of variable speed motor on it because it runs anywhere from 1000 watts to like 400 watts when it's running, and like 25 watts if it's just the fan. Goodbye. Wow.